there's some more seats up in front if anybody that's standing wants to sit. Or if anybody in the back wants to sit up front. Or if anybody on this side wants to sit on that side. Good evening, welcome to SciArc. In the uh, continuing episode, the Wednesday evening lecture series. I want to make um, an announcement before I introduce uh, Dell. Uh, Saturday night, actually we've been announcing this I think every week, um, but this Saturday night we're having the, uh, the uh, first in a series of, uh, of concerts. Uh, jazz, we're calling it the, it's the Jazz and Contemporary Music Concert Series. The uh, performance will be given by John Carter and his octet. Uh, he's not a, a popularly known uh, clarinetist, but he's in the music uh, industry. He's the type that influences other composers and musicians. He's uh, someone who's consistently won the downbeat critics poll for the clarinet. Uh, Having heard him perform here last year, I can, I can uh, tell you from direct experience that it, it's, uh, it'll be quite an extraordinary event. The, uh, an, an hour before the concert, there'll be a workshop that he'll give, a master class workshop. Um, I suppose he'll teach you how to play the clarinet, I don't know. So. Anyways, it's, it'll be, I think it's worth uh, coming to. The students get in for free. So, you get in for free for everything, but uh, this one, um, we have to charge an admission for those that aren't uh, students or faculty. So, okay, on to the business at hand. Uh, this is actually fun introducing people. It's tough when you introduce people, it's actually tough introducing people that you don't know and, and quite tough introducing people that you do know. Because the tendency for me is, is to um, sort of eliminate all the stuff that lets you know who she is and makes you, make, I always feel compelled just to tell you all of the stories uh, that, <laughs> that one can tell from knowing someone. Um, so I'll, there'll, there'll be some illusion, to, but not, not many stories. The, uh, I met Adele, this is the, uh, the, the uh, anecdotal side, um, I, was, I was surprised uh, to figure out that, that, I, that I met you, uh, I think, four years ago. And uh, for some reason, um, perhaps because the kind of person she is, or perhaps everything that's happened since then, it seemed, it seemed much, much longer than that. Um, as we say, it seems like 10. Um, she invited me to teach. Uh, a design studio at the University of Pennsylvania where she chaired the architecture program for six years uh, from 81 to 87. And I realized in uh, thinking about it uh, that it was really quite an exceptional time. It was, it was a time well spent. It was very stimulating to work with the students that she had provided and uh, the work that they produced was very gratifying and, and I think um, for me quite informative. And it was also, I think, uh, a time where I began to know not only Adele more closely, but um, um, some of her values. I, I spent uh, time uh, going in and out of Philadelphia, and uh, many of those, uh, those trips um, were spent uh, meeting friends of hers uh, at her house. The house served as a kind of uh, a salon at the time where many people that were coming through Philadelphia, architects, scholars, and the like, uh, either coming, merely coming through Philadelphia or passing through the university, um, seemed to be at these events at her house, small dinner parties. And it was, uh, it was quite stimulating. The first time I'd ever experienced uh, being in a place in an informal setting where there was uh, a wide array of people with uh, a, a wide range of interests. Um, discussing 
everything that they were interested in as well as what you were interested in. And it was always a good mix. And there was always a good mix of, of talking, and, and it was quite uh, stimulating. The, uh, I realized that um, the kind of intersections that she choreographed at her house were formalized at the university, at the School of Architecture, through a program called, uh, um, uh, it's an annual event that was called Design Week, where she would invite in approximately a half a dozen architects. They would work on urban projects, all would work on the same project with groups of students, and it was done in, a, in this kind of cooperative, uh, uh, with this cooperative spirit. Um, over a period of a week, everybody working uh, uh, at a fast pace and in relatively close proximity, um, there was a lot of exchange back and forth. It was um, quite a healthy interaction. And I know that uh, quite a few friendships uh, were begun there. Um, some of the more recent ones in her last uh, year as the chairman, um, it's where friendships between Craig Hodgetts, Wolf Pricks, Michael Sorkin uh, began, which has lasted, it's an intense friendship that's lasted uh, ever since then. And the friendship isn't only based on having a good time hanging out in Philadelphia and with Adele, it had to do with the sort of sharing of ideas, uh, which I tend to believe to be critically important. Um, it seems that uh, um, this, uh, this is something, I guess, just speculation on my part that um, she's had, I suppose, what I might call a, 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 this, all of this is sort of a latent form of matchmaking, uh, which indicates, I think, uh, her keen interest in, uh, as well as insight um, into the significance of social interaction. And I think that um, she sees social interaction as, as a factor in the making of architecture, as well as all the other factors. But I think uh, uh, she continually, uh, her work continually reminds me of, of, uh, of that being a strong component, as it must be. Um, I think it's quite evident in the work that uh, she's recently been doing, um, especially a project that she's uh, um, nursing along in Los Angeles, which is uh, an affordable housing project in Hollywood, which was part of the uh, case study revisited. Um, that MOCA, Museum of Contemporary Art, sponsored. Uh, she won that project in a competition going head-to-head uh, uh, -head ag against uh, um, whom I would consider to be a couple of our best local talent. And it was, uh, it was kind of, uh, it, was, it was interesting seeing, seeing her project beat them out. They're still friends, all of them. The project is on display at MOCA, for those of you that uh, would be interested in seeing it, um, the model of it. Now, that isn't all she's done. She's actually, um, at the risk of sounding like a typical male architect, uh, I think she's got one of the few practices in the country, and this is something that um, should inspire the, uh, the women in the program here. Um, it's very difficult. This is definitely a, a, a male's profession, or it has been for a very long time, and she's broken that barrier. The, uh, the, uh, both the, the, the amount of work and the scope of work that uh, she's gotten in recent years, I think, uh, attest to the extent to which uh, she's broken that barrier. She has her, uh, she's a principal in her own firm in Philadelphia. And uh, she's been practicing for over 20 years. Um, so the work goes back much further. Um, her experiences both in uh, architecture and urban design, uh, many of her projects, before I, I had met her, I knew of her work uh, through publication. Um, other projects, oh, she also recently won one of the buildings in the Arts Park competition out in the San Fernando Valley. Other projects that she's um, currently working on, uh, institutional facilities, um, two projects in, uh, in Reading, Pennsylvania, a Center for the Arts, um, and this, this one I didn't, I didn't know what it was. An, uh, an, a natatorium. Swimming pool. That's a swimming pool. <laughs> a covered swimming pool. Did, did anybody here, anybody that knows what a natatorium, raise their hand. Uh. You get bigger fees for doing a natatorium as opposed to a swimming pool. Uh, she's also, I think, um, uh, she's 
she has, um, is also doing work in Japan, as um, a growing number of people um, are doing these days, uh, which is quite an exciting place to work. Um, besides all of the work, as I had mentioned, she was, she's, uh, she was the chair at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, where she is currently a professor of architecture, and she was also a professor at Harvard and Rice uh, University. So with all of that, um, all of you give a, a welcome to Adele Santos. Thanks, Mike. He makes chairing the architecture school at Penn sound like a load of fun, and uh, I couldn't wait to get the hell out of it <laughs> two years ago, you know. So talking about, I thought you were going to describe what we ate for dinner, you know, that was, I said to Sarah, it's probably going to happen, uh, as Mike has done on other occasions and embarrassed me totally, you know. You forget the rabbit stew and the, God knows, the hot pepper ice cream and whatever, you know, but uh, yes, indeed it was fun and, and having the weeks at at Penn with the likes of Mike Rotundi and Craig Hodgetts and, you know, all sorts of people who've taught in the school. Um, that, that was really great. Um, I think my career is a, is a somewhat strange one, and, and I have to explain this a little bit because uh, of the way in which I, I'll break down the sequence of the slides. That before I, I came to the United States, I'd been practicing for four years in Southern Africa, Botswana, Swaziland, and South Africa, and, and built a body of work. And when I came to the States, it was really to teach. And I thought I'd do it for hmm, a year or two or something like that. And it's a devilish thing. You know, some of you are already in it and in the same situation. And once you start teaching, you know, you get to do more and more things. And, you know, you're, you're your assistant professor, and then you're a full professor, and then Harvard steals you, and then somebody else steals you, and then you become the chairman. And, you know, now there are all sorts of people sort of sniffing around and asking me to be a dean, you know. And at a certain point, I suddenly realized it's like a decade had gone by and I'd barely done anything. So four years ago, um, I took a sabbatical and I gave myself four months precisely to get back into practice. And I did this by doing a series of competitions. And um, I seem to have a reasonable track record at winning these things. I haven't got any track record in building any of them. But that put me in practice. And so two years ago, I stepped down as chairman. So when I, when I show you the slides, um, there's going to be just some of the early part, really, just to show you. Um, just, it's really just a sample of the work. And, I, and I'm not, not going to explain it very well. And then I'm really going to show you the things I've been doing in the last four years, um, and, and including, obviously, the MOCA project and, and the Arts Park. Right? But I think I feel a sort of slight obligation to start off by making some kind of statements about, you know, where I come from in terms of my head as, as an architect. Um, because wandering around the halls of Sayoc, I have to say <laughs> that what you're going to see this evening, uh, or what I might say about my work, um, may be very different from, from what I see here. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say there's anything right or wrong. It's just you know, the way in which I perceive my role in the universe. And um, I have to start by saying that I, you know, I really see architecture as a humanistic discipline. Um, I, I think of it as an art that can't be uh, approached too abstractly because it really, for me, has a very strong social reality. One's usually dealing with a context, a time and a place, and a culture, and people, and users, and, and so on and thus. And so, you know, I, I come in at the end of the spectrum, you know, people refer to me as being social. I, I do, as an architect, feel a kind of a sense of a social re responsibility. and which is much more strong than my, uh, my will to, to, to make artifacts, to please my own creativity, and so on. Um, and I say this without any kind of morality attached to it. It's simply the way I, I do believe uh, uh, architecture is. Um, so having said, having said that, um, necessarily makes me talk a little bit about, um, you know, how do I go about thinking about architecture? Um, now, you know, fads and fashions have gone and come with a rapidity that, you know, makes one think the whole profession's gone gaga, you know. I mean, we've, uh, we've had a, an, an awful knack of, of scrounging in, in disciplines, I guess, close to our own, but even far away from our own, you know, to find the inspiration for architecture. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it, and I call them the ologies and the isms. I mean, you know, we've had, you know, we, we don't even have to get into it, most of you know, but I mean, with an extraordinary rapidity, we've had postmodernism and neoclassicism and you know, and so on and so on. That's, and, you know, now we've got deconstructivism. And um, in a funny way, it may partly have been that I've been teaching a lot, 
uh, and I haven't been building for a fairly long period of time, you know, I've been watching this from the sidelines because for me, um, architecture, the mission is not a very complex thing. To do it is darn difficult. It really is excruciatingly difficult. And it's a whole question for me then of, of you know, how to create an architecture that I believe is, an, is appropriate in any, any of the given contexts uh, I've worked in. And I'm, I'm talking about, a, these sound like easy words, but I'm talking about appropriate in a very uh, complex sense. I'm talking about that it's culturally responsive, that it's contextually appropriate, that it makes technological sense in the place where it is. Um, that it deals with the issues of climate and, and, and the, the ecology, um, and that, you know, I can't a approach a problem really as a kind of an abstracted thing. I really have to take the situation and I look at it analytically and I try and understand and synthesize those things that I think are appropriate to the solution of that particular problem as set in that particular place. Now, it, if I actually had, for example, if I was a postmodernist and this was my personal vocabulary, I'd probably have failed absolutely miserably in the work that I'd been asked to do because, you know, I've worked in low cost housing in Africa. I've had to build, you know, a, a church and a school for $60,000 in Swaziland. You know, I've worked with home builders in Japan. And in a way, I see myself in many of these places as a kind of a cultural anthropologist. I go in there, I try and get my, have my antennas out and to really understand what to do in that, in that, giv that given situation. Um, the MOCA housing, you know, it's, um, it's a project actually I could only have done in Los Angeles. I'll show you a house I've just built in Tokyo. Um, it could only have been made in that place, all right? So sometimes it's very difficult to look at what my work is and, and put a label on it, and, and it, at a certain level, I'm, I'm, that, that makes me very proud because I think, um, my work, I think of, I think of very much in terms of space. That'll be quite clear when you see this. Um, I really start off as space as something that, that is experienced. And, I, and every single project I've ever done has had a very strong strategy, some kind of a concept about space. Uh, and it, very often it might be attached to the idea of spatial illusion, trying to make something feel bigger than it is or, or more extensive than it is. Um, a lot of the projects I've been given uh, are very low budget, you know, dealing with very small spaces, trying to make them feel bigger. So there's always some kind of, there's a whole story about space and spaces and experience. And then once you start talking with that, you also start talking about space and light. And so, you know, there's been an obsession with, with natural light and, and how that affects space and how spaces may change their nature night, night and day and so on. Um, I think I've been very much involved with a kind of flirtation with landscape. You'll, that, that'll be fairly evident throughout, from the beginning to the end uh, in the work. Um, you know, flirtations with, with the natural environment, uh, kind of interfacing with it, overlapping with it. And a lot of this has to do with the idea of how I approach the making of space, blurring the boundaries, extending the vistas through, um, understanding what space would feel like as you, as you, as you pass through it and, and, and so on. Now, um, as part of this whole issue about you know, trying, to, trying to generate an architecture that hopefully is appropriate in its context, but also reasonably timeless, I think this leads me then to, um, in, in, in terms of my own work, I have a very distinct methodology. And um, it, it, I've been in LA too often this month to have really caught up with what Sarah had sent me about the title of this lecture series. And last night I went, oh my god, representation. Now what am I going to say? Well. Um, the fact is, yeah, I, I do have a form of representation, something that I myself believe in and I work with. And it's a tool in terms of my design process, and it's the way in which I discuss my ideas with other people. And it's a, so, you know, and I'll show a number of, of slides and sequences of things because there isn't ever one idea in what one does. Um, there are many ideas, many overlapping ideas. And so I have this way of, of kind of diagramming concepts, which I think uh, is something that I've, you know, it's a, it's a particular thing that we've been developing and it's very much part of the office and people who work there get to know how to do it. And it's a way of explaining the complexity, intellectual complexity of a series of things that, that come into the making of, of any one piece. Um, the other thing actually that I've done a lot, which is also part of this methodology question, and it's, it's saying to, that, that I've often been asked to do new prototypes. Clients come to me, I'm a little bit spoiled. I really only like to do the things I feel like doing. 
So a lot of people come and say, we need a new type of whatever it is, house here, or uh, we've got a new, a new idea about something. And so I'm often asked to develop prototypes. But it's also a way of thinking that you say, well, let's just take this thing apart. Let's look at the very nature of what house means. How do families live together? How do they relate to the neighbors? And out of this, you'll develop uh, a plan form that you may never have thought of before. Just, it's a kind of an argumentation process. So with that in mind, I will start giving you just a bit about the background. The first house you'll see, in fact, was precisely that. It was a prototype. I took the nature of house apart. And um, it's really house as the microcosm of the city. I was just thinking about that the bedrooms were like houses within a house and the corridors are much more like streets. And there was a whole way in which I was trying to think about just decoding what the house was. It seemed such a, an obvious thing. Let's think about it in another way. And it was a, it was a house for, for a series of adults living together. And uh, it led actually to, to some other work. All right, so with that in mind, do I have to press these buttons? Whoops. Okay. Now, as I said, I promised you I wouldn't spend a lot of time talking about this, but the axonometric um, on, the, uh, on the left, there are a series of cells, which you, which you can see. Those are really houses within the house, and they're kind of bedroom, bathroom, suites. Uh, and when you're in them, you have no sense that, there's, there's another ha that you're part of another house, because you look out towards the garden view, uh, and each, each of the cells within the house has its own garden. And I'm going to just take you walking through this house. There's a very kind of conscious process of moving from the outside realm, the public, up something that's almost like a conceptual drawbridge into the house, through the center of the house. You know, if I jump around, can you hear me? And above it, I've created an artificial black hill. And the point about that was my first exercise in spatial illusion, because it was a small property. And I wanted to cut out the sense of the street and really focus in on the trees of the neighbors. So there's, uh, there's no way in which you can actually measure the scale of the property. Um, so it was the, one of the first explorations into the interrelationship between the natural environment and the built form, spatial illusion, and then there were a whole series of social issues about you know, creating uh, a, a new prototype. So we're actually going up uh, through this walkway to enter into the house. And looking back, you can see you, you come up, and there's sort of screens on the side that prevent you from looking into, into the windows of the house. Yeah. they focus? They're focusing. All right, and it's quite clear in that section over there what I'm talking about, that you can actually, within that house, you pick up this landscaped hill, which is in fact part of the house, and you see the neighbor's trees way beyond. And we're actually, this slide on the left is standing um, on the garage, uh, looking towards the, the dining room of the house. This is in Cape Town, sorry. That's right, if you need to ask me anything, go ahead. Um, we're actually, the whole house has no steps in it. They're all ramped ways. And um, the, the floor of this is all made out of blue brick. So it's really literally the outside materials come to the inside and, and kind of vice versa. And uh, where that, uh, that dog that looks like it's expiring uh, is, you know, you can see what I mean is that you don't know where the street is. You don't know where the property ends because you've actually captured your neighbors on the other side. And um, as in many of the, the houses and old buildings that I've done, I'm really interested in kind of connecting vistas from the inside to the outside, making places for summer, places for winter. Uh, in this case, the so-called corridors really become areas where it, it was actually used in earlier days for display of artworks. And uh, again, sort of bringing natural light in through the roof um, into inner areas which otherwise would not have had any light. And uh, finally, um, within the bedroom, looking out to the garden, your own captured view, uh, and you can, you can begin to see the system. We're really not talking about uh, when you're in your, your own little house within the house, you feel very private indeed. Um, this then led to five houses um, very close by, in which we literally built within a garden. This first period, by the way, I was working with uh, Tony Santos, and uh, we, we, we worked 
in an existing garden. We literally wound the houses around the trees and we came up with a prototype which was based very much on the house you've just seen and then there are variations on the theme. And each house has solariums on the roof, it has ramps, stepped ramps going out into the garden. We plant the roofs, so literally the houses become part of the landscape. And each house is slightly different because we had to capture a tree here, save a magnolia there, you know, and, and so on. So the, the idea is you can see them clustered together, they're large houses. We were creating the street edge, which is very anonymous and, and, and very discreet, and the houses literally open up to the landscape, which also happens to be the direction of the sun and the view. So you get a sense of the kind of privacy in the driveways, the houses opening up to the gardens. Um, by the way, this is the building technology is very much of that, of that place. We built a lot in concrete and brick and, and stucco. Uh, the slide on the, on the left is actually um, on the second level where you can begin to see the terrace of the, the bedrooms in this case with, with the lawn which is actually on the roof and then the houses are very blank um, one to another so that the privacy is retained. And now we're going to go into house number five and each entry sequence is very different. It's always involved with light, light coming down on the door uh, through a skylight like this or through a little court and so each entry sequence is different and all the living rooms are very different and a lot of other things repeat. For example, here there's a little court that brings light to the door, and here we actually split the, the skylight. Um, and then there are things like windows, which we call daisy windows, bringing in light onto the floor, as you could sort of, literally, it, there'd be, that was the herb garden on the other side. Um, but also views through, constantly trying to play up the sort of the spatial dimension of the house through vistas through into the garden and so on. This house was actually wrapped around a, a grove of trees, which we retained. And you can sort of see on the, on the right uh, the um, kind of a ramp going up uh, to the solarium on the roof. And then the columns of the house echo the columns of the, the, the trees themselves, in this case tall uh, slender trees. And you can see a little bit about the court and then a solarium on the roof. And um, each living room space was really very different, bringing, bringing actually stepped ramps that went from the inside of the house as well as the outside up onto the roof, which then was an excuse to bring in the morning sunlight into the living rooms. Oh, let me see. There we go. You know, and places to sit and, and courtyards of, of the dining areas. And so each house became very special because of the circumstance that we found it in. Uh, in this case, the cypress trees helped set up a diagonal wall within the living room space. Um, and, you know, it, when you're in there, it's, it's quite easy to understand the, the response. The bedroom wings behaving very much like the ones in that first uh, prototype. And the, and the step ramp really dividing the garden of the, of the bedroom section from the living room. And uh, this, uh, this is before the house was finished, um, but it just gives you a kind of a sense of the scale of it. Of much the same period, um, uh, a seaside house for, for a dentist and his family um, with a solarium on the roof. Uh, this house, a lot of the form of this house comes from really trying to protect the family from the very fierce winds that came off the mountain and, um, and, and also really trying to respond to the views, um, the dramatic views. Not that they weren't dramatic all around, but they were special ones. And, you know, it's a, it's a house that sort of really, as I said, responds to its natural environment in particular. Um, very private again from the street, the sort of stepped ramp kind of drawbridge effect in a way leading through to, in this case, the parking of the car on the upper level, which is a function of the site. Um, different ways in which light was brought into the, into the house. Some sense of kind of the dissolving of the corners by butting the glass, which was something that I did then and I still do now, trying to kind of extend the sense of the space, although this house is extremely small. And the solarium on the roof and the terrace on the lower level. Um, a house, again, that, that's really got two faces. It's got a, a very kind of anonymous, um, very private edge to the outside world. It's another one of these funny panhandle sites. Literally, you go up a ramp to get to the entrance. And on the garden side, which is the, it's the one with the Brie Soleil um, and, and, the, and the terraces, really flirting with the landscape, uh, with the trees, with the mounds, with the hills. You'll, you'll see what I mean later. And it's a house for a family with many, many little kids. Um, I'm not going to bother you with the plans, but just getting a sense of the actual context and how you leave the context to enter into the house. 
And as you kind of move around the house, it begins to open up and you have a kind of a sense of, of, of the landscape surrounding it. Um, the, the sort of next to the chimney, uh, there's a little seat in the, in the children's area where they can sit in winter and it feels really warm because they're above the, the fireplace. Um, but they can look out and nobody can look in. Um, there's a spiral staircase that allows the kids to go up because they've also got houses within the house. So in a funny way, I was taking this famed prototype uh, the exploration, but now we were stacking it. And the disconnection between the geometry of the upper level and the lower level means you can have things like the terrace where you can see a child in the chairs, uh, sort of sheltered, that's where they, they sit in the afternoon and drink tea. And um, the brise lifted off the building so that the breezes can go through. So in fact, we get the shade where we need it, but we, we allow the breezes to pass through. And you can begin to see how it really does respond to the kind of the mounds and the trees. Um, and here again, it sort of really, again, just trying to work very carefully with the climate. Um, and the house changes its character. It depends on really where you are. When you're on the sort of mound, it becomes this rather shy house uh, that uh, if you look at it flat on, on the other hand, it's also kind of very robust and, and somewhat romantic in its sculpturing. Sort of the buttered glass corner, um, the very small bedrooms actually for each child, but um, it feels very, very generous when you're inside it. And finally, the last two slides in that sequence. A very early experiment on how to make an apartment uh, feel like a house, and so these are two-story stacked dwellings. Um, but the upper level begins to get, within the Brisele, this is a very early building, um, a garden in the sky, which is generous enough that you can actually dine out on it, plant on it, and so on. Those are the very early shots. Today, you can't even get close to, to photographing the building because the plant life has literally taken over. Um, but the point about the, this is it's a Brisele, so obviously there's climate control. Um, it's a privacy screen, so people down below aren't, their space isn't violated. It literally is a garden, a hanging garden in the sky. And um, from the inside, you can begin to see how generous it is that you're actually sitting on the living room on the third level uh, with a terrace outside where you can actually plant in a fairly substantial way. So you've got the climate control, you've got the space. Um, and then in, a, in an interesting way, the view then gets framed. And although the view was not too fantastic, the immediate view, you've got this foreground which you've created for yourself. All right, so we'll leave that period. Um, there was this hiatus. and. Uh, I guess after all those years of being a good citizen serving the profession, I was getting a little restless. Um, and uh, moved to Boston to teach at Harvard and got involved with the, um, the, the redevelopment of a large building in the, in the uh, leather district. And this was a, another essay altogether. You know, most of my early career, I'd been very obsessed with, with the plan and the poetry of the plan and what that meant. And over the years, I'd been thinking more and more spatially. And I, I guess one of the ramifications of that is that I started to be really obsessed with the section. I, I usually start a project looking at the section. I don't even look at the plan. I start to think about space three-dimensionally, which immediately leads me to drawing sections. And um, this was a very large kind of loft area and was my first sort of experiment with what I called an inhabitable staircase. I, I wanted to find a way of moving through the levels but that, that this would also allow me, for example, on this lower slide here, you can see north and south. I was actually slicing light through into the space. And I created this staircase that, that gets steeper as you go up, um, as, as you go to the more private areas. And then it also operated as a theater for showing films and, and slides and so on. So um, what I was really creating, this inhabitable staircase, had a multitude of functions. Uh, and um, it also got steeper and it got narrower and it got lighter as it went up. So the, there's, a, there's a whole spe game of spatial illusion um, within this, this, uh, this dwelling. Um, actually just entering into it, uh, we'll just get a sense of, of what it's like. And so at each level something different happens, but at the top of it, it's actually animated by this enormous skylight uh, to the north, which is also the window that allows you to look at the downtown view um, on another level. And then, you know, where it's a bookcase on one side, it then becomes a headboard on the other side, and then underneath all of this mound is the sort of the bathroom, which is kind of reasonably sexy. You, you know, I used to joke about it being like Marilyn Mon Monroe lying on her side, you know, sort of climb up into the soaking tub, and, you know, it does many things simultaneously. And 
The whole place is painted in shades of shadows, which means that it really changes its character as the light fades and, and so on. Um, and then, of course, the other screen for the dining area. And so what you have is you have a sense of the kind of intimacy of space, and it's very particular wherever it is, but it also feels very generous. You have an idea of, of, of the continuity of it. Um, obviously, the kitchen-dining relationship. As you go up the stair, you can begin to see what's happened, that the stair, sorry, it gets wider is what I meant to say, and steeper as you go on up. Um, one amazing thing is actually as you go down the staircase, it's sort of very dramatic because your gait changes as you reach the bottom and uh, people would sometimes enter for these uh, soirees um, and enter the middle level and sort of arrive very dramatically, you, you know, at the, at the bottom. Um, but that gives you a sense of how the, how the, the, sh the shape of the space is. Um, and then finally at the top, the very, very top, that north light window then plays another role. It, it picks up the downtown view and uh, it, it's telling you another story. I tend to do things twice. So, um, you know, you, you tr have make a prototype and you try it out again. And now I'm, I'm moving to Philadelphia to be the chairman at, at school. And it, of course, needless to say, I do have to have a place to entertain the critics and, and so on and so on. And I have a habit of buying the most disgusting looking buildings I can find. And, and the one with the big black door is it. Uh, it actually still looks like that, Mike can verify. But uh, again, this is the perfect problem for me. There was no light. There was no light. There was no view. And uh, by the way, one thing when I reflect on it later, the Boston experiment was really me creating a landscape in a context that the landscape didn't exist but that it then became internalized. Um, and it took me time later to understand what I was doing. Uh, but there was no place to look at, no nothing. So I, it was all created internally. So here, if you can see how it was and what it is, but this time I was trying to bring in light deep down into a studio space on the lowest level and also to bring south light into a north-facing room. So I'm often crisscrossing light, north and south. Um, and then it, there seemed to me to be an opportunity, one, to make a giant skylight bringing light into a studio space, to create a, an internal garden, and to bring the south light in simultaneously. And uh, it looks more or less like this, with long vistas going through the space so that you can actually see down the 60 feet length from side to side. The light in the middle of the house actually is that skylight which was cut in. Um, to bring light down into the studio below. And that's where I worked for a while until um, I found myself never being able to go to bed because there was always somebody in the house doing something. Uh, and, the, and the office finally moved. Um, but as you go up through the levels of this house, you finally get at the very, very top level to a roof garden and you capture the downtown view in a surprising way. Um, buying another disgusting place uh, for my studio, um, playing out some of these things, these spatial themes that are quite evident now, before and after, um, actually digging a lot of soil out to, to create a habitable basement, which then allowed me to create a little hill, which then began to play the game of the indoor-outdoor sort of merging, uh, bringing light in in strategic ways and so on. So there's a lot of kind of surgery that took place. And just giving you, not wanting to elaborate on this, but some sense of how you actually approach this with this hill that was created that obviously is very important to the view on the, ins on the inside. And then painting the walls, um, kind of shades, again, shades of shadows, but this was sh shades of ocean, actually, the times of the day when you think you're uh, not in Philadelphia, uh, maybe in the Aegean, you know. Keep your fingers crossed, too. And a sense of what the studio is like and how the light is cut in in different ways. A whole addition added on um, to that was actually a parking lot, as you probably saw, and, and this is really the office. But to more serious things, all right, so I, I was now an academic. I've taken my sabbatical. I now have to figure out what to do about it. And uh, the, the only thing, I didn't know anybody who had any money who might build anything, heaven forbid. So I decided, you know, the only thing was, was competitions. And I entered Hawaii Lower Competition uh, um, for, uh, uh, it was called the Pacific Center of the Media Arts in Hawaii. And that perfectly dreadful building sitting on the, on the right, the site, the bold patch next to it was the site for putting an amphitheater, two theaters, an art school, a music school, um, and uh, art galleries and so on and thus. Uh, we won this competition and uh, I was then sort of in practice uh, instantly. Uh, the views were fabulous. Um, I won't, and this was again me getting back to the whole idea of diagramming this, and I'm not going to get into it in too, too great a level of detail, but 
there, there were a series of um, issues in terms of the site context that were really important. But I think the two generative diagrams were these ones, that we actually had a kind of a, a mountain and a valley. And I, I saw this, these, two, these two landforms as being, first of all, they were complementary. And I, I realized that the program dealt with private functions and public functions, which you can see the top of the two diagrams. And so I really put all the performance spaces related to the valley. That's where the public would be invited in. And I turned the academic facilities looking up the mountain, a kind of fairly logical extension of all the interior topography I'd been playing with over the last couple of years. And the idea of a courtyard actually being in the middle of the art school where they display their art, uh, focusing up the hill on, on towards the mountain. And then the valley actually is crossed by uh, a bridge. And why a bridge? I wanted to keep the natural airflow uh, up and down through this valley so that we wouldn't have to um, use air conditioning and so on. And then once you've done that, it's possible to think that you can actually, at a very high level, be able to circulate around through the various performance gardens that were necessary, but crossing the bridge as well. And you can begin to see how the natural airflow worked. And um, ultimately, the building complex, as, as you see it here, with an amphitheater back to back with a legitimate theater, crossing under this, this open air bridge into the bowl of, of, of the valley, which was actually the, um, the lobby and the cafe and so on. Uh, and then with the art school, which is on the, um, on the left, you could see the courtyard looking at, up towards the, uh, the, the, the peak, uh, which is fairly dramatic. And this is a section through, obviously, the art school with a trellis with Bougainvillea, as we saw it, um, really being the center of the school and, and trying to really work off the nature of that place and, its, uh, and what, what, what was the magic of it, trying to, to capture that and really enhance it. And then the, re the reverse was that the bowl of the, of the theater itself matched the bowl of the valley. And so, you know, with these two sort of intertwined cut forms, beginning to think of that as a special kind of a garden and water and a place to sit and, and, and so on. Uh, so we won this competition and I was awfully excited. I thought this was fabulous. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's f fairly typical of what happens. But what it led me to do was to get a, get a real project. And I realized, actually, as I was putting the slides in very late last night, that I really don't have adequate representation of it. But this is the setting. It's Albright College in Reading. And I'm doing the Center for the Arts, which is right now under construction, on the two tennis courts, which are in the middle of the slide on the right. And um, through a whole analysis, really, of the university itself and the paths and, and so on, it became fairly clear to me that there was no gateway to this campus, no way in which people entered. And we very quickly came to the idea that the Center for the Arts would actually be the arrival place. That's where people would enter uh, the campus itself. And that there was sort of an embryonic open space network on the campus, which we could then um, add to. And once we saw that, we started to think, well, the quadrangle is, a, is an idea. It's a type within, within kind of academic contexts. And, so we started to group the facilities around um, the, a, a courtyard space. And because we had, again, some topography to deal with, there was also the whole idea of trying to create in, indoor-outdoor relationships. Um, somewhere along the line, um, the college asked me if I'd like to get into an art, artist-architect collaboration. And I said, sure, why not? And Mary Biz, the, um, the sculptor environmental artist, is working with me really to deal with the outdoor spaces. So the diagram is, is, the, is the circle, as you see it, is really the entry gateway. It's the place you, 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 you walk through, and the facilities are clustered around it. And um, this is actually, the circle is placed in a rather significant spot in terms of just the geometry of the campus. Um, and it's also on the, one of the kind of old routes. It used to be um, farmland, and uh, there were old trails. And so one of the ideas was how, you know, how to capture the space, um, what to um, uh, how to define it. And one of the ideas I had, and Mary was very obsessed, as some of you may know, with circles and circular forms and shifting circles. And so we started to get into this whole dialogue. And I created this roof, which um, really defines the space and, and shelters it. But it also acts as a kind of giant, it's almost like a sundial. Uh, because the shadows on the ground, as you pass through the space, are, are kind of magical. And they'll be shifting, obviously, with the season. Um, I'm just, just giving you a glimpse of this because I, I really don't have the drawings to show you. And having entered through this place, you can begin to see how the routes then will take you to other parts of the campus, 
uh, the little dot, 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 dot line is kind of one of the, the old routes, the old farm routes. Um, and this is actually it's almost like an old farmhouse, which is still on the site. And so we've been playing with the idea of coming through, since it's the center of the arts, coming through this sort of entry gateway into a place where they can have spontaneous performances and music, you know, and, 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 and theater, theater is also part of this. So that's just to give you a glimpse of that. All right, which then led me to get the Institute of Contemporary Art, which is a project that we right now dealing with um, uh, at, on, on the campus at Penn, which are facilities uh, to show, obviously, contemporary art in an extremely complex location. There's two gray um, buildings are indeed just, they look exactly like this. It's, it was a period of architecture which was absolutely gruesome. And the site we were given is literally where I put that little diagram. I mean, we wedged in between these two monster buildings uh, on an extremely tricky site. Um, I'm not gonna give you the preamble of the history of this, but really, um, we're, we're sitting in there and um, having to you know, sit back in every which what direction with a long block that's actually below the, the front tower, which you can see, um, which then becomes the workshop block. And then the whole idea of creating a sort of a sculpture garden on top of this for the displaying of, of, of work. Um, and really then f beginning to worry a lot about you know, how this building relates to the sidewalk level, how it relates to the, the buildings in the background, and how to make this, this institute, actually it's a very obscure site, somewhat visible. Um, I was really concerned about animating the street edge because essentially this is a black box and it's in a, in a context where there's a lot of p pedestrian activity. So the idea of actually entering off the corner, which is shown on the diagram on the left, uh, became a fairly real one. Um, and you could begin to see the model as was sort of mocked up early on. But then to the rear, there's a whole, you know, the, the, gallery, um, the gallery spaces are, are really to the rear and there's um, a long along the line that leads to that garden block is are the lobbies. And then the real question was what to do. And then I had an idea of creating a ramp that led from the lowest gallery to the galleries on the second level, that once you're no longer able to really view the art from above, you'd actually come out to the street edge. And that that would then become a giant window to the street. Uh, and we actually were able from a higher level to project onto those walls so they can have images changing um, or they can change color. And in a way, it's a display that tells you about what works are being shown um, in the gallery itself. Um, and then there were various entrances we had to create to various things, the buildings next door, which I shall not bore you with. Um, and then, you know, really looking at, at how to relate the, the upper lobby, the lower lobby, and how to, how to, how to talk about the street, where students would be walking up and down um, um, with great frequency. And so we created that big window where you can actually stand and, 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 and look at the passers-by, again, kind of linking this building, which is, you know, in terms of many of its activities, rather hermetic, with, with the, the world on the outside. And you get a sense of, of the big window uh, on the upper lobby leading out to the garden. And obviously kind of dealing with all the usual things of how to bring the light in and how to have the spaces overlook one another and the whole sequence of how you really look at art. And the relationship, for example, of the offices on the upper level, um, being able to then look down into the galleries so you start to get long diagonal views um, in section through, through the building itself. Um, and just two more shots of that. Okay, we're gonna change slide trays now. Um, that building is about to start construction and uh, it's, it's been a kind of an alarming experience because it's the first time I've worked in a, in a design build project. I mean, from the time that we were commissioned to the time they will actually be in the building, we've got just slightly over a year. And so we had to start working uh, from day one uh, with the builder. Uh, the budget for this building is about half of what it should be. Um, and you know, it's fine in LA to, to have a building that's got no finishes in it, as we may witness, we're standing here. Uh, in Philadelphia, uh, you know, I've had a devil of a time persuading them that it's not a brick building, um, that maybe an institute of contemporary art has, uh, something happened. Um, you know, that, that maybe contemporary materials may, were absolutely essential to creating the right sort of ambience for this building. Um, there we go. Whoops. 
And indeed, we will. We will actually open the doors um, for a big show in, in, in early September next year. Um, you know, if, if this survives the sort of last round of the chop chopping block. What I'm going to show you now is um, just be because, although my whole background has been in housing design, you know, you, you win the Center for the Arts in Hawaii, then you get another one, and so it goes on, and suddenly I find myself um, uh, involved with arts facilities, which is, has been a lot of fun, which is the reason why when Craig Hodgetts had dinner one night at, at my dining table and, and Mary Miz was there, we decided, well, what the hell, why don't we just go in for the Arts Park competition? Um, Craig was reluctant because it just, you know, God, did we have time? And I said, oh, what the hell, let's just do it. So we assembled a team within a few days and uh, were shortlisted for two of the five facilities, um, the Media Center and the Natural History Museum, which um, Hodges and Fong were the sort of, you know, the prime office on, and uh, the Performance Glen and Grove, which mine was the prime office on, which was really an amphitheater um, and, and garden spaces and, and a restaurant uh, and bar um, on, the, on the edge of the lake. And we won both of those facilities. Um, it was one of the more interesting projects I've worked on because it was really quick. I suppose we all took about, I don't know, three weeks on it. There are lots of friendly faces in the audience here who you know, helped us construct the models and, and, and get it together at the last minute. Oh, I see. He's expecting me to do this. Uh-huh. So I can stop jabbing. There we go. Um, I think Maggie did all those trees. Maggie sat very silently for about four days rolling these little trees. Um, but um, I'm, I'm just going to go through this really quickly because I, you know, I think Mike's introduction was extremely generous uh, and uh, so I will not talk as much as I normally might. But essentially what we were doing is when we went to the valley, it was, it was a desert again and it struck us that, that in a way in creating the arts park, what we wanted to do was to reenact the history of the site. So we started off by thinking about irrigation systems and we thought about planting it with trees. And then we thought about how many of these, these, these um, plantations get eroded as people build on them. And uh, so we were re really literally reenacting the process of, of how the valley was uh, originally developed over time. And so we started off with the idea of the water towers which will signal the presence of the park and that the irrigation system which is on the right would set the paths, the pedestrian paths through the park and um, that the trees would act as a kind of a spatial grid throughout the site, which could then be taken away. That the water towers, which is on the right, would be very significant in terms of the experience of the park. Um, that the parking lots and everything else would really be um, hidden in the trees. We created this giant circle. We were dealing with a natural history museum, so we got into all sorts of co cosmological discussion about really that this was First of all, it, 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 it made a clearing. It, it, was, it was the idea that it was really the cosmos. Uh, we were also marking spots on it that, that talked about the position of the planets. We were looking at lines of significance across the site that we could somehow mark. Um, we talked about marking these at night nice with laser beams that could crisscross the park. We were looking at the tree grid and how it could be modified. Uh, this is all the sort of underlying matrix which really, you know, was some of the ideas surrounding um, our master plan for the park. Uh, the facilities that we were involved in, which in particular was the Ramada restaurant, which you can see in the right, where we were literally taking the restaurant and beginning to place it in the lake, playing games with the overlap between ground and water and so on. And the amphitheater, which was also on the edge of the lake, which is shown in the slide on the left, where we began to think of that as not just an amphitheater, but maybe it was something more mysterious. Maybe it was more like a volcano, a hill, that people wouldn't really know what it was until they got there, um, which then led to a whole kind of dialogue of discussion. But here, the idea of merging the land and the water, which is shown in the slide on the left, that we literally started to create water gardens. So where the lake began and end was somewhat ambiguous. And then on the right, the idea that if we did this, we could begin to signal the presence of the lake and the, the Ramada restaurant uh, with waterfalls, having these come uh, and, and gently lap down, which is illustrated in the slide on the left. And that in fact, pavilions on the line of the trees would go all the way into the lake. Um, so we kept up the spatial matrix that we'd set up with the trees. And that in fact, these pavilions, which could have dining barges attached to them on the left, would begin to capture a piece of the lake which could be a lily pond, a wonderful water garden. And the sense of the kind of ramada is these really kind of lightweight sort of floating um, metal screens uh, to shelter the diners uh, as shown on the slide on the right. 
and the private parties could dine on, on, on the lake and sort of as shown on the right. And that in the center of the lake, actually, we'd have a fantastic bar. This is, by the way, one of the purposes where they raise money here, which would be perfect. And you could commission artists to, to, to design boats, which is shown on the, on the left. And you could sit in the bar and the Alice Aycock piece and God knows the Vito Conchi would float by with people paying, <laughs> paying some money to sit in a, God knows, a banana shape, something with, you know, et cetera. And of course, it could all be magical at night, you know, with a bar floating in the lake, which was like a lantern. Uh, and then we could actually have spots and dots in the lake that we could actually light it in different kinds of ways. Uh, and you can begin to see some kind of sense of, of what this would be like with the artist's boats and, and, and these kind of pavilions in the water and the water garden actually, which would be a combination of the trees we'd set up, but also very tall palm trees. And that in fact, the, um, the amphitheater stage would also be in the water and that the backdrop of this, um, at the back of the stage, um, would actually be a glazed screen that we'd be able to, sh to, to throw lights onto and project from, from the other side. You can begin to see with the sort of the form of this thing, which is some, somewhat, somewhat volcanic in shape and suggestive, but very mysterious. The entry that you'd see as you arrived at the park, but you wouldn't know what it was. And um, in fact, you'd go up through this mound on this giant staircase and coming, you'd come out at, at an upper level into this place that would be rather surprising. Or you might have a spiral ramp that would lead you up and give you views of the art park. And that gives you some sense as to how we saw this, this strange mound uh, appearing in the landscape with this grand staircase leading up into it. And the slide on the right showing you some idea of, of, of the back projection onto the glass screen, which would be standing in the lake and, and hopefully somewhat mysterious. I'll leave you with those two images. So if this goes ahead, well, you, you'll have me back. Um, the Mocha project, very briefly. Um, this, you, can, you can mull over to your heart's content if you really care to because it's sitting and being uh, poked at by various visitors uh, in the museum. I think the models are going to destruct quite shortly. But um, what we were really trying to do was to, it, it, it's, it's an argument really about trying to um, not to build the status quo. I mean, in that area, they're very large scale projects and uh, very monolithic buildings. And we wanted to really create a kind of low scale, small scale, village like, uh, really definitely romantic um, um, series of spaces that people could enjoy. And because of neighborhood opposition, we were really concerned about these appearing much more like large houses behind garden walls with trees than, than an apartment building itself. Um, the Dingbat apartment, which is shown on the left, the centrally loaded corridor, the you know, one orientation, no through ventilation, was definitely what we did not want. And we, we didn't want any corridors, any elevators, any escape stairs, and we didn't really want to excavate. We wanted to take the land as we found it and try and work with it in a way that really created an extremely humane um, living environment. Um, I had a sort of a social theory about the fact that there would be about 185 people living in less than an acre and that it was much too large a group to really get to know each other or really survey the environment. And so the idea was to break it up into smaller groups, more like a series of extended families where you'd have old and young and large families and small families sharing a series of things. And I basically said that they'd have their own garage, their own laundry, their own lounge, their own porch, their own play area, their own series of courtyards. And that in that way, you can provide an environment for a group of people who would really sort of act as a larger extended family because we're talking about very low income people uh, and many of them are single, single parent households and the usual sociology. Um, that this would then find a correlation, as I said, in a series of courtyards really concerned, obviously, with, between view and, and sunlight and how to actually deal with the natural slope of the land and capitalize on the advantages that we could get from it. So the slide on the left shows you the way in which the section was working. Um, I, I didn't want anybody to have to walk up more than about one floor to their dwelling unit. Um, and uh, in most cases, they don't have to do that. And there's some very complex dwellings which you won't get into. But I was really, as you can see, that these are the platforms above the, of, above the parking and I also have a series of pedestrian ramps which allow the handicapped 
to actually go through this project, uh, although there are, um, there are eight, eight different levels. And the ways in which the courtyards were organized, I've been very interested in the diagonal, which I didn't bring up because uh, it's too complex an issue, but that if you can actually begin to design spaces that are read on the diagonal, you obviously pick up the kind of longer dimension. And particularly when you're dealing with a downward slope in this case, stepping towards uh, the south, uh, and um, so the, the courtyards are very much organized around these series of principles because although they're small, there's always that sense of release, always the feeling that you can look out towards the street, towards the trees, towards the play areas. Um, the, um, then there's a whole kind of sociological argument about you know, living in this place, about the community porch, which you can see in the diagram and you can see in, in the slide, where people can sit in the afternoon and they can watch the kids playing down below and below that is the laundry lounge, uh, which is also related to the entrance from the parking garage. And so people living there would be able to monitor who, who is a stranger, who doesn't belong, uh, and so on, and, and hopefully keep the environment uh, really safe, which is an, uh, particularly an issue in, in low-income environments. And this you know, is more of the discussion about this, how the laundry lounge relates to the playroom, the playgrounds, the, obviously the parents you know, using that, that otherwise utilitarian space would actually have something to look at and be able to, to deal with, with the children and, and their activities. And so what we've done is we've arranged a series of these courtyards. Um, actually, after we won this competition, Craig took me to some of the old Spanish-style courtyards. And in fact, I realized, gosh, this is, what I, this is sort of the spirit of what I was trying to, trying to, to do. Um, the view there is obviously in one of these courtyards looking towards the community porch and the, and the view, the distant view. Um, uh, and just giving you some kind of sense of, of the general ambience, you know, why curved roofs? I really didn't want this looking like a low-income housing project. I didn't want the repetition. There are many, many building type, dwelling types and many, many choices in here for, for people to live in, and I thought that was extremely important. And you get a, you get a sense of, of the character of the place. And uh, you can see the sort of entry ramp uh, in the slide. And uh, you can see the sort of entry ramp uh, in the slide on the right. You can actually climb up. It's almost like going into a small town, a small walled town, um, with a series of streets that actually go through with the ramps and the different ways and, and the different kinds of choices. In fact, there are different, many different dwellings, which, which I, do, I won't get into now. Uh, we recently won a competition in Camden, New Jersey for affordable housing. And, and here we've gone for modular construction. Uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, we can build a three bedroom house with a one and a half bathrooms for about $63,000. And we chose to go for twin houses in otherwise a row house context. And we try to pick up on the typology of the place, the porches, um, the kind of street wall, but tr to try and, and do it in a, in a different way. So the, the whole idea about the twin house, it's actually an upgrade. You get more windows. Um, you're able to park your cars because you've got the side yards, you can park from the front, you can park from the rear. Um, and um, so within, and it, it also fitted within um, the grid of, of the, um, the property subdivisions in Camden. Um, so there was a kind of a long, complicated argument about precisely how we did this. And the houses are divided in such a way that the slide on the right shows the kitchen in the middle. So the, the, the the, the person working in the kitchen is able to survey the garden, the play areas where the children might be. And there are also two living spaces in each house, so you have some choices as to how you wish to live. Um, and some of the sort of images, we had to present this to the community. Um, just the idea of the porch, which is very much part of the sociology of the place and, and what it would be like. Um, again, surveillance on the street. The idea then that you could actually build between uh, the houses, you could build upper level decks to cover your cars, but this was something that could take place later. And the slide on the left shows you a little bit the, um, the way that in which the street works. Um, and obviously the house and a row of houses with, um, by the way, one interesting thing is that they were being sold in pairs and uh, the, the family that bought the house would actually rent to a very low income tenant in the second half, and so you were actually buying a twin, uh, and then you could choose whether or not you were going to have your parking from the front or from the rear. So these are going ahead. Um, this is a little house that uh, I designed for Misawa Homes in Tokyo, uh, which will be mass produced in a factory, and this is a two family house. And um, I'm not going to show it to you in too much detail, but 
in a way, it's, it was about the sort of argument that, that I, I made initially that, you know, I've just, there's a two, you've just seen a two-family house in Camden. This one's for Tokyo, and it's clearly a Japanese house, uh, although I'm not trying to make it um, so overtly so. Um, and one of the things that, that, that made it very different is that you've got no space in Tokyo. You've got no outdoor space, and people build very close to you, side by side. So one of my ideas was that the most fabulous place in the whole house would be on the roof. And so on the roof level, I created the outdoor space, which meant that the living room actually goes up to the roof level. And uh, the slide on the left shows you what the roof is like from the inside, uh, allowing light in in four different directions. And each corner of this house actually has a terrace. And so the living rooms are at the top level. All the family rooms are in the middle level with the bedrooms. And then they have a tenant or a grandparent on the lower level. Uh, when my clients saw this, they said, oh my god, this, this looks like a castle. This looks like a Japanese castle. And, and uh, you know, uh, you can understand that in, in, in spirit. Of course, it isn't. Um, but it's a very, you know, for them, it was a very attractive image and exciting thing. It looked completely different. They'd never seen a house like that before. And, and in a way, it, for them, it was a new type. Um, now I'm going to quickly show you three buildings, two of which uh, have been built. Um, I had a wonderful commission. People often ask me how I ever got to, to Tokyo, and uh, it was a kind of a crazy story. I was there on vacation one year, and uh, a woman who I called the Tiger Lady, because she's really fearsome, um, kind of corralled me and wanted me to design a building for her. And I said, look, I, I'm on vacation. This is really impossible. And you know, after about a week of haranguing me and finally seducing me with the best sushi bar in Tokyo, and uh, you know, got some drinks in a revolving restaurant, uh, I kind of capitulated, but I said I only had six days. And she said, oh, days and nights, I said, she said, what do you mean nights? Nights we play, days, days you can work. And this, the, there was this kickoff session in some nightclub where, you know, God knows how many bottles of Dom Perignon went down the hatch. And, you know, we like, got up, we were absolutely hung over the next day, and we had six days to do this project because that was all the time I had. Anyway, I uh, cut a long story short, um, she then phoned me about nine months later from the top of this building. She said, it's fabulous. I absolutely love it, you know. And there was a newspaper article, a, a magazine article about this whole process, and there were some photographs. And she done you know, really dreadful interiors. Anyway, it described me, it described me as, as, this, as this architectural samurai that kind of came in and saved the day. And I got off the plane, you know, with my pen where the sword would normally have been. So suddenly, you know, I was like hot because, you know, Miss Holmes said, God, if she could do that in six days, you know, I mean, how long would it take her to design a house? You know, so, you know and that started my, my career in Japan. Anyway, um, this client who's really been, in a way, my benefactor, uh, came to me one day and he said, you know, we love, the, we love her house, we believe you work real quick, and I have this, an impossible site and an impossible problem for you, and uh, I want to make a museum with, for the works of this man, Mr. Imai, uh, but it's also my office building, and it's on a, a piece of land that's about the size of a house, uh, with a completely crazy, um, you know, agenda. So I said, fine, and we had setbacks. Uh, you could see uh, this sort of diagonal setback is actually from the light conditions. Uh, we, we're talking about a, a minute property. And so he wanted a very public function, i.e. a museum, in a space that otherwise was um, a very private space, i.e. an office building. It's, it actually was his headquarters. And so the, the diagram on the right, you can see I created, the first idea I had was, why don't I make one fantastic painting, like three stories high, an enormous a triptyque and let Mr. M.I. paint that, and that will actually relate to the public level. People could come and look at this painting, as you can see, right, on that diagram. They would come in on the second level and see this three-story high painting, but on each office floor, you'd look at a piece of this painting. And Mr. M.I. and I talked at some length about what this could be, and, you know, he talked about the seasons, and I really thought the painting would change its character very much from the bottom to the top. And linking all the levels through this is a fantastic, was, I hope, fantastic staircase um, that winds its way up through all of these levels. Um, and underneath the staircase are all the service facilities. So these are the two sections. Slide on the left shows you this, this high kind of gallery space. And in the basement, there's another one of these things, another, and each is top lit, by the way, as you can see in the section. So the idea was to create two fantastic walls which would serve the public nature of this building and that all the other um, 
rooms would actually look at it in a more tangential way. So in the axonometric, we were trying, because you have to set back, creating garden spaces off each office level. There's this zigzag staircase that sort of winds its way through the building. On the top, you can see there's a painting that's sort of tilted. It's the only thing that isn't at right angles to the building because almost like um, a tokonoma in, in a Japanese house where you, you, know, you display very precious things that tell you of your worth. In a way, I wanted that painting to be like a tokonoma because it was really the wealth of, of this company. I mean, we're talking like a million dollar painting plus, you know, nobody will give me the figures. Probably cost more than the building. Anyway, so, but just changing it slightly at an angle, um, of course, increases its significance. So here's the site. I mean, the building's built. Um, and you can see, I mean, you're, you're dealing with, it's, it's like it's one meter between walls between adjacent buildings. It's really stacked up and, and the setback and you can begin to get a sense of the garden terraces. Um, and on the very top, my client wanted a, a terrace where he could drink to the moon, uh, champagne to the moon. Uh, you know, when you're rich, I guess you can ask for anything you like. And this is the staircase that greets you as you enter in the building. You can see it zigzagging up through the space and it's sort of lit, uh, obviously, by the windows that face the street. Oh, by the way, it's a, it was a typical problem that I kind of liked. There was no light on the site. I mean, how to cut light in, in all sorts of different ways. And of course, the view going down, you kind of, um, you can see there are little windows that bulge into the staircase. And that's where people display things on each level, a wonderful bowl of flowers or some gorgeous fruit or an artifact and what have you. And uh, then you enter into the room with the triptych. Um, and you know, deliberately, just about all the surfaces are shiny, so there's a lot of kind of reflective light. The painting is gold, as you can see. Uh, natural light lights it from the top. It's spring at the top, and I think it's winter at the bottom, but you know, it doesn't graduate in quite the ways I thought. Um, and that's, this is really the kind of the, the public salon that they come into and view the artwork. Um, and then I also started to play with the floor, and on the right is really the diagram of how we cut the granite so that very close to the painting it's very, very somber and sort of uh, almost monochromatic. And as it w moves towards the light at the street, it, it picks up the sort of rosy tint. It's sort of almost weaving the, um, weaving the stone together and you get a sense of, of the floor. And the desk in, in this building uh, is made out of glass and, and, and steel. Uh, and in fact, pieces of the floor kind of rise out uh, to support it um, uh, on the grid uh, of, of the floor. And then, of course, from the offices on each level, you get a different glimpse of the painting, and the public can actually view it from these galleries at the, at the higher levels. And then at the lower level, again, this becomes a very different space. It's more like a sort of, it's a bit of a theater space. It's where they have musical performances and things like that, and yet an entirely different painting there. Uh, he loved this building to, to absolute bits, and so um, he decided he wanted a bigger and better one, uh, which later became called Tokyo Fantasia. Uh, this is a typical view of what you get, and between these two rather ugly buildings and the slide on the right was our site. Um, we designed this building about five times because he kept on changing the agendas, but that's fairly typical of working in Tokyo. So, um, and it, 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 every time it got more and more fantastic, and then finally he said Tokyo Fantasia, and the most fantastic thing at the end was getting in Alice Acock to design a roof garden. Um, you know, which uh, was going to have, among other things, a magnetic oracle. So he could take his friends up onto the roof and, you know, they, they could sort of find, you know, their future, like you, you will fly, you know, you will grow wings and fly in space and whatever, right? <laughs> so, um, and then th there's a whole story about this building. As you can see, there's a story about most of the things I do. And, you know, so I was sending he him these things in the fax machine. But this was a whole discussion about the fact that obviously there's no light on the site. You, you know, the streets are three meters wide. There was really only one facade in which you could bring in light. So very clearly, it became a building that had an atrium. And the only things he told me is he had two themes. He wanted nature and he wanted comfort. And so for me, nature meant natural light and it meant um, a garden in the center of this building. Uh, he also had another idea, which was that he wanted to invite the public into this building, um, as he had in the other one. But in this case, it would really be the public walking through the building, almost like a sort of a street. And um, I suppose this is the kind of critical diagram here, where you see there's really two kinds of atriums. One is a garden, one is private, and the other one is a public space. And the public sort of gallery, people can walk through, it's glass, slips up into the garden. And then the whole idea was how to make that wall. And, you know, 
quite clear now in the staircase. So the, the idea of this fantastic thing zigzagging up from this, the inner garden to the garden on the roof. Um, part of the theme. And then a whole discussion about what was this wall. And the idea was it was going to be glass and steel. And it was a staircase. It was a place to sit and have tea and drink and socialize. We could actually plant. Um, and the space on the inside would be very different um, in character. But there, there was this wall that would divide the private and the public grounds and uh, one from another. Uh, mercifully, I've got a fantastic engineer who figures out um, how to make some sense out of all of this. And there was a study of, of, of this sort of staircase screen, uh, the idea that the landings were the sitting places and um, that, in fact, the offices, uh, we, we did a lot of studies about trying to see how light, light could be bounced in from upper levels, but that was the sort of one of the earlier cross sections where offices are paired um, with a double volume space, as you can see there, onto, onto this garden terrace. And that you'd wind your way right up to the roof and at the top, there would be this fantastic garden. And later, there was also an outdoor garden, uh, which Alice Aycock designed. And these are some of the early studies um, where you can begin to get the sense of this, of the stair kind of zigzagging its way. And, and really, uh, quite sensual of these sort of these sitting spaces uh, and uh, where you could actually go and smoke a cigarette or, or drink your tea and so on. And then a lot of sort of real questioning of how to deal with the facade. I mean, wanting this building to be very open and very friendly, which is sort of the spirit of the company. Also trying to reflect that sort of the profile of the interior of the staircases and also dealing with some peculiar geometry that we found on the site. Um, and then later, uh, this sort of developed into an idea really that the staircase on the garden side would be really like a, a framework, a lattice, somewhat rustic which held up translucent panels, glass, on the inside, so it was sort of acted in a way like a shoji screen. And on the inside, the, the more public area would be really shiny uh, and, and have that sense of, of the translucent screens, but on the garden side, as sort of represented in that model a little bit, there'd be this grid that was actually holding up the shiny glass. Um, and uh, then the roof, the, the roof terrace, of course, is the culmination of the staircase sequence. Um, and then some ideas of, of the second round of the model of, of really what it would look like. And actually, as the sort of the stepping in the facade relates to, you can see the larger windows where the steps occur, those then become the conference areas that, that were located on each floor. And at the very top is obviously the, the sort of suite for the president of the company, um, which is represented with its own kind of a garden, uh, and it's a two-level um, two space and some idea about the kind of entrance uh, into the building. This, um, this isn't going ahead on this site. However, he's negotiating for an entirely other site. But to compensate me, he gave me a tiny little building to do. Um, they like to put names on this. The, the first building you saw is called, it's called Kacha Fugetsu Kan, something like that, which means flowers, bird, clouds, I don't know, you know. The next one was called Tokyo Fantasia. This one, unfortunately, has been called Illumination. And I said, that's a, d d a dreadful, dreadful thing to, to call the space. But um, it's a very tiny site. Again, it's one of these really crazy things. And I think the cross section, which is represented here, was a very important thing. Because the street is to the uh, left of the slide on the left. And the idea is that you should be able to see into the space, see down into the, into the basement. Um, and then within the building, all the views sort of crisscross. So we have a number of interlocking double volume spaces. But the back walls on the opposite side from the street would all be skylit from the top so that the light would actually wash the back walls in a, in a very kind of gentle fashion. And then the south, which is to the street, we, we started to work out a series of kind of sunshades um, that would protect this very large glass wall. Uh, and then the balcony, which is over the door, begins to sort of address uh, the entry sequence into the space. And we have two sort of interlocking staircases, which you can see on the slide on the right. Um, this building, I guess, will be under construction soon. Um, you can begin to see some idea about the, the sunshades protecting the window um, and uh, something of the spirit of, of, of the place. And this is the last project, um, which sort of in a way comes back to the sort of the idea of the first one. I haven't been able to do a house, a real whole single family house for a long time. And the same client came to me with the site. And uh, he said, 
he wanted this, uh, this house in the forest. And, you know, to get a forest outside of Tokyo uh, is, you know, enormously rare. I mean, this piece of land must be worth a few millions. And so the house then became a whole exploration of how you build in the forest. And it's a sort of, a, it's an essay. It's an essay about um, inhabiting a piece of the forest. And because the forest is so precious, I did a series of diagrams thinking about how, how would I work within this forest. He also wanted a fireplace and he wanted a swimming pool. And the slide on the right really shows that I felt that there should be a relationship between the place of winter and the place of summer. And we created the space that goes through the house, it'll be evident fairly soon, where literally I'm inviting um, the forest into the house. Uh, there's this great sort of sky window that links the place of the winter, uh, which is in the sort of inner side of the house on the upper levels, to the swimming pool actually, which is um, on the outside. And, uh, you know, at, at one stage I described this house as really being, it's almost like a leaf in the forest, sort of sheltering the family below it. And uh, the roof, which may or may not be apparent here, actually changes its pitch. So it gets steeper as it goes towards the chimney and much flatter on the edges. And having said that, immediately the discussion of copper became apparent. And he said, copper, of course it has to be copper. So um, the roof became copper. Um, and the idea about this, this series of, of um, sort of apertures is that you bring the forest into the house. I mean, it's such a precious thing that when you're in the house, you're actually able to look at the canopy. And you'll see very soon that the columns that hold up the sky window are themselves tree-like. So it's sort of the man-made trees in the forest are, are part of the house. And so it's really this, I guess, ultimate merging of indoors and outdoors. Even the swimming pool itself is more like a kind of a natural pond that you might find someplace. Um, uh, and the, 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 the living wing is, is to the right, these rather large spaces that step down the hill, and the, and the bedroom wing is, is fairly simple. This is a guest house, and it's used for entertainment. Um, and so you can see kind of the, the diagram of the model of the, of the tree-like columns. And um, the rhythm, actually, we use the Fibonacci series for the kind of the rhythm of the slats that protect the, 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 uh, the, the the I mean, the, that are part of the glazing system to, to shield um, the light, which is sort of, it it's almost represents the kind of rhythm, the funny so-called arbitrary rhythm that you would see in the forest. We started with much more of that and it sort of got itself pruned out, but I was really interested in the idea of the kind of apparent random, but also obviously ordered sequence that I saw in the forest of light and shade and so on. Um, and here's the house itself um, sitting very much in the forest. We had to keep most of the trees, which is, of course, what we did in that very early project I saw at the beginning. And from the outside, the house is very shy. It sort of you know, peeps up out above the walls. And you can begin to see how the roof begins to change its pitch as it moves from the chimney to, to the other side. Um, we used Indian sandstone uh, for, the, for, the, for the, the chimney and, and some of the walls and the paving. Uh, you can see the copper roof with the skylight set in there um, and it's you know it, it actually looks very beautiful in its context because it really sort of um, feels like it's merging in and uh, the outside is, is is an Oregon pine which hopefully will will keep its uh, its coloration but the way into the house in, in as in many Japanese houses is it's it's you know there's a sequence you go through and it's really very private uh, and finally you arrive at the place the side uh, view of the house uh, as you can see um, with the chimney the back background um, and then as you come around the house the swimming pool itself and, and it's a Japanese house where the idea of actually being able to slide enormous doors back is really important and so the, the doors slide back, back you know in the summer months and of course the whole house opens up to the terrace to the view and, and everything else and when you go into the house itself um, and they they have very little furniture in, in the house because that's the way they like it you can begin to see the, the, the column, the, the tree-like columns and, and the kind of the view of the canopy um, through the glass. And um, obviously the one is we're looking out towards the swimming pool and we're also looking up towards the more private, the more intimate, the more cozy areas of the house uh, with, a, with a fireplace sort of uh, family area at the, at, at the highest level. And there's even a little nook that you get to at an even higher level where you can um, have a place to contemplate and, and be alone. Um, trying again to sort of pick up on some of the rhythms that we've seen and some of the kinds of patterns that you get um, in, you know, Japanese woodwork is, is, is fabulous. The idea of the screen, the screen walls, uh, the patterning of walls um, 
in this case we're looking down the corridor area um, in the uh, the bedroom wing and on the right you obviously we're now in the in the um, the study area looking down towards the the pool the little staircase going up to kind of a hideaway nook uh, in the roof and the last two two shots actually just showing I guess we were talking about the potential roof leak um, and uh, uh, one of my favorite chairs in the whole world where you can sit there and what's wonderful is the kind of the dappled light you know changes as as the day changes um, and so on anyway that's all I have to say tonight thank you But I will answer questions if you have some. Okay, <laughs> that's fine with me. <laughs> Good.